Good afternoon and welcome to this ACT webinar on cash investment opportunities for treasurers in the new regulatory era. Uh, my name is Stephen Baisby. I'm a member of the Policy and Technical Departments of the Association of Corporate Treasurers. First, let's explain the technical points about our webinar setup. On your screen, you'll see a menu bar across the bottom that allows you to open various windows and you can move these around your screen, resize them, or minimize them. The green button with a question mark on it is down there for help if you have any technical difficulties. Another button opens the Q&A window. Send questions by typing in the Q&A window. Don't wait until the end to send your questions. Just send them in if they occur to you and we will be dealing with them at the end of our presentation. Our practice is that we do not disclose any names of the people asking the questions. I should add that uh, uh, a recording of this webinar will be available on the ACC website in two days' time, along with a separate copy of the slides. The total uh, time of this webinar will be 45 minutes. Any questions unanswered at the end of the time will be passed over to the presenters to respond directly. Now, corporate cash investment has changed through the change in financial regulation, which has been put into place following the 2008 global financial crisis. The main change has been reserve capital ratios that have reduced the attractiveness of bank deposits to corporates. This occurs as money market fund regulation remains under debate. The risk of this alternative may, becomes less attractive. Our speakers today will take us through the reason. The method of the tripartite repo market, which has become the forward and more efficient means by which corporates can place their funds. Speakers will refer to trading platforms in the discussion. Some of you may be aware of the MIFID II changes of the own account exemption brought into question the status of use of these. This remains work in progress, and we will not discuss these changes here. Should you have any questions or observations you wish to raise on that topic, please feel free to forward them to me through technical at treasurers.org. Now the webinar will require, uh, will comprise uh, three presentations. First by Steve Letterby of Clearstream, uh, then by Nick Burge of Lloyds Bank, then we'll return to Steve for a bit of explanation on the process of repo transactions. Then Darren Wilson of Booper will talk about his experiences as a user of these uh, so if I can hand over now to start off uh, our presentations uh, to Steve Lefferby. Okay, uh, thanks Steve. Um, good morning everybody, or oh, sorry, good afternoon everybody. Um, thank you for tuning in. Um, my name is Steve Leatherby. I'm Senior Sales Manager at Clearstream, uh, responsible for global securities financing for UK, Ireland, South Africa and America. Um, okay, what I'm, I'm going to kick off by, as Steve said, I've, I started off with a couple of slides on my side before I hand over to Nick. Um, so what I wanted to go through um, from, from my area here is, is really just talk about the new regulatory area, era uh, and what we're seeing um, in, in the, the corporate treasury space um, from a global securities financing perspective and, and really what the, the regulators are looking to achieve that are really going to affect your, your side of things. Um, I think uh, if we look at the, uh, the, uh, the blue box or the blue triangle on the left hand side, um, we can see that um, We've got things like transparency. I think uh, the regulators are looking to, to, to make things transparent. Um, they want to evaluate the risks in the financial markets um, by reporting the century to a trade repository. So um, I'll go into the more detail in the following slide. But it, it's obviously being transparent in what you're doing. Um, you've been able to report that, and, and I think what they've, they've brought in have, have been uh, looking to achieve that. Uh, secondly, uh, they're looking at stability. So when we say speak about stability, we're talking about um, secured funding, um, the fact that you have um, been able to, to, to fund your, your cash in a secured manner. Uh, and number three, uh, we're looking at security. So it's actually um, with regards to uh, using, collateral, using collateral as a mitigator of the counterparty risk and reducing the risk of things like bailing, for example, which I know is it's something that, that's um, we've been moving around for, for a number of years, and, and, uh, but I think it's becoming maybe a little bit more highlighted uh, in the current financial climate. So uh, next slide here just talks about really how the regulations uh, are impacting treasuries. So 
again referring to, to the triangle on the left hand side, I think for, for transparency we look at the trade reporting uh, and there's the two major areas that, that come in under the trade reporting have been earlier um, with regard to um, reporting for derivative transactions which um, came out in, in January 2013. Uh, I think um, most of those uh, that are listening now should be uh, fairly comfortable that they've um, put that on board. Um, and I think sort of further down the line, we're, we're looking at SSTR, which is the Security Financial Transaction Regulation, um, which is basically, uh, again, um, reporting um, regulations um, from a financial perspective and the tools that we have in place for that. Uh, number two, we have stability. Uh, I suppose the advent of BAL3 and TLD4 has, has introduced um, wonderful acronyms like the liquidity coverage ratio and also the net stable funding ratio. Um, I don't want to go into that in too, too much detail because I think Nick's probably going to uh, touch on that um, in his following slides. Um, but again, the way that that's been interpreted within the, the financial market, I think probably changes uh, from, uh, from bank to bank on that side. And finally, on the security side, um, uh, collateral. So the BCBS, IOSCO, uh, regulations around uh, encouraging the wider use of collateral to mitigate investment risk. Now that's things like um, seg, seg IM, um, segregated initial margin, um, which is the use of collateral to cover um, OTC uh, derivative transactions. Now that's um, going to be coming in in September this year for um, the, the top 25 um, banking financial institutions, but I think it's going to be become further relevant for um, organizations like corporate treasurers in the further phases um, further down the line. Um, anyway, um, that's my two slides to begin with. I'm just going to hand over to, to Nick, who will um, take you through the... the uh, Thank you, Steve. So I'm Nick Birch. I look after the strategic liquidity business at Lloyds Bank. Uh, where we focus on the overall liquidity needs of our corporate clients. So as Steve said, we're going to touch on some of the key regulatory drivers that are impacting cash investment from a corporate perspective and, and how that impacts corporates. So apologies, this is a fairly busy slide, and I promise you I'm not going to go through every regulation. We're just going to pick out the ones that are particularly relevant in terms of liquidity. So what we've got here is, is the four main buckets of financial regulatory reform. Obviously, these are designed and are working to make the system safer and, as Steve said, more, more transparent and more stable. That obviously benefits everybody using that system. There are, of course, some unintended consequences and knock-on impacts for, for the users of the system. So that first bucket of regulation, that the bank capital and liquidity regulation, so, so those coming out of BAL3, as an overarching kind of macro level, um, and again, just focusing really on, on cash management, liquidity management, what those regulations do mean is the overall capacity of the banking system is, is shrinking. So higher capital requirements obviously result in lower overall capacity and, and the European banking system as a whole is estimated to have capacity shrunk by sort of 10-15% since the crisis. The, the second key bit, those regulations and particularly the difference between the risk capital ratio and the leverage ratio mean there are different impacts on different product types and also for different counterparty types. The, the leverage ratio is probably the most impactful in the liquidity space, and it's where we've seen the greatest amount of movement over the last couple of years. So the introduction of a simple gearing ratio means that certain product areas which are inherently low risk um, returns on those products may not be sufficient under a, a simple gearing capital metric, um, whereas they, you know, they return required standards under a risk capital, a weighted capital return basis. That's particularly impacted areas such as corporate deposits and, and repo inventory. The 
second bucket of regulation, bank structure reform. Obviously, there are various different reforms, and, and I'm not going to go into any of the details here. But in terms of, of liquidity, Steve's touched on bail-in, the <clears throat> impact under Bank Resolution Recovery Directive of creation of a, uh, a differentiated credit of waterfall, uh, different bank structures. So for corporates interacting with banks, it, it makes that interaction more complex, and you have to look at different bank structures in different jurisdictions. And <clears throat> you'll often come up with different conclusions and you'll see different demand dynamics from those different entities. The third bucket, the <clears throat> market reforms, making the system more transparent, different regulations in different jurisdictions, that's fragmenting market liquidity pools. Um, you'll be seeing that across different products, not just in the liquidity space. Um, and again, there's been a net overall reduction in capacity in the system. So I think many people are seeing that secondary market liquidity in certain products is lower than it's been historically. Some of that, of course, is masked by current ECB uh, and other central bank QE activities, but, but generally that there's lower secondary market liquidity. Looking specifically at <coughs> those two um, <clears throat> FAR 3 requirements. So as Steve said, the liquidity coverage ratio, the net stable funding ratio. So what we've got here, liquidity coverage ratio on the, on the left-hand side, coming down through you know, the FAR 3 requirements, so LCRs are a requirement for banks globally, the European requirement uh, coming through CRD4, what the liquidity coverage ratio is looking at is short-term liquidity risk in the banking system. So banks need to ensure that they have sufficient liquidity to manage through a one-month stress event. <clears throat> banks will look at the outflow factors on their liability base and potential drawings under <clears throat> committed facilities, margin, and other collateral positions. Determining that liquidity outflow depends on the type of counterparty providing the liability, so specifically whether it's a corporate, a retail, or a financial institution who's depositing the, the cash or, or, or other form of liability, and the tenor and maturity of that transaction. From a corporate perspective, what it means is, firstly, the good news is that corporate cash has more value to a bank, particularly uh, down at the short end than financial institution cash. Uh, as you know, corporate cash is treated as lower outflow and has a 40% outflow factor sub one month, whereas financial institution cash has 100% outflow. So I'm sure many of you on the line will be seeing banks looking for corporate deposits, uh, whereas they'll be less keen on financial institution deposits. The right-hand side, we have the net stable funding ratio. That's a longer-term liquidity and funding metric. That's coming in in 2018, but, but most banks, and our bank included, are managing towards that metric. That pivots at a one-year time horizon, and what the net stable funding ratio basically says is the more illiquid the asset base of the bank, the more stable and long-term the funding needs to be. So in very simple terms, if you were holding a balance sheet purely of short-dated short treasury bills, then you could fund it with very short-term liquidity. If you have a lot of long-dated illiquid assets, you need longer-dated funding. Specifically in terms of corporate uh, cash and liquidity management, this this again favors corporate counterparties over financial institutions. Corporate cash is treated as more stable under the net stable funding ratio, and this impacts both unsecured deposits and repos. So again, I think many of you will have seen that banks are keen to take cash and provide securities under repos 
with corporate counterparties. The overall impact, as I said, is, is, a, is a shrinking capacity in the system, so you know, the repay market overall has shrunk in size, but the proportion of, of corporate activity and banks focusing on corporates is a bigger percentage of that. So I'm going to hand back to Steve who will run through some of the mechanics. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, so I just basically, um, a couple of slides here I've got, which covers really the, the tools that are available to, to treasurers. Now, we've obviously discussed this uh, in high level previous slides, um, tri-party repo being one of those. So um, I suppose that comes under the stability umbrella on my previous slides. Um, where we're looking at um, secure financing uh, managed by a third party agent. So um, that third party agent being Clearstream. Um, so what it means is that you as a cash provider can able to, um, to deposit your cash with the same counterparties, but on the back of that, take collateral back in. So um, this is just a brief slide to, to show you really how that works, I suppose. And it's, again, it's very high level. Um, it's, it's a question of you as a cash provider um, becoming, uh, appointing a, a third party collateral management agent to do that on your behalf. So it's very much um, the, uh, the clinician being your, your tri party um, collateral manager on that side. You've got the counterpart on the other side that also clients as well. Um, the trade terms and, and what you do within that are also agreed on a bilateral basis. Um, with regard to the way the collateral is managed, then that's um, held in a segregated account in, in the name of you being the, the cash provider, um, so it's all full transfer of title. And with regard to, to what Clearstream will do as a tri-party agent is we do all the, the post-trade administration. So from your perspective, it's very much a, a hands-off rather than a hands-on type scenario. So once you've agreed to trade with the, the counterpart, you'll agree to deposit terms, etc. Um, and basically all you'd need to do is to ensure that your, your account is funded. And everything from there is really handled by, by us uh, as the agent. So all the collateral that's required to, to cover that exposure, any substitutions, any, any uh, corporate actions, any mark to markets, um, it's purely hands-free as far as you're concerned. And, and hopefully the, the diagram that you can see in front of you sort of briefly explains that. Um, so the next slide, I just want to go into um, the other tools available. So we mentioned earlier about the collateral management side um, and the fact that, that you are within the program, uh, that you're actually a collateral uh, taker on this side. Um, I think it, it shows you in the, the middle slide here, which is the, the green and blue, which means that, that if you're a collateral taker, it also means that, that you have the ability um, to, to reuse collateral as well. So. So as you mentioned before, with some of the regulations coming in around uh, BSPF, um, I also go around um, clearing or, or collateral required for your OTC derivatives business, then basically uh, within the tri-party setup that you have, um, you have the ability to reuse that collateral with other um, collateral takers or other um, people that you may have um, exposures with on a derivatives side. So again, you know what it's basically saying here is that, that that within that framework, you have the ability to do that. Um, the reuse is, again, it can only stay within the Clearstream tri-party world, but um, it's just the fact that the, most of the, the people that you face off to um, will, will have a relationship via, via Clearstream. So um, I suppose one of the final questions on the right-hand side is really does it involve a lot of paperwork? And I think that's always been a huge barrier to entry within, within the tri-party world, or seem to be a huge barrier to entry within the tri-party world. Now we've looked to, to simplify that process, um, paperwork-wise. Um, now GMRAs have, have always been a, a massive barrier to entry on that side. We have the Clearstream Repurchase Conditions. It's something you, you may or may not be aware of on, on previous webinars or, or, or presentations that, that we've done. Uh, and the CRCs, as we call them, are basically looking to, uh, to it's a, a GMRA, for a better word, for purely for the, the Clearstream tri-party world. So it's an umbrella agreement. You use that once. You can then trade with other counterparties within the Clearstream tri-party um, world that have also signed up to that document. Um, again, it, it's something that's, that's deemed to be extremely popular, um, and uh, most of the corporate treasurers that are now coming on uh, to tri-party within Clearstream uh, are utilizing this document. Um, 
So uh, yeah, um, so that's um, the paperwork side of it. Again, we, we try to simplify that as much as we can um, as, uh, as a way of, of accessing the tri-party repo world. So finally, um, I just want to discuss some of the technology around that as well. So we talked about uh, the tri-party repo, uh, secured funding, um, placing cash, getting collateral in, then also the ability to reuse that. Now, with regard to the technology side of it, you know, there, there's various ways that we're looking at. Um, on the transparency side, we're looking at things like the, the reporting requirements um, for things like trade repositories. Um, there are things like Registr out there. Also for the SFTR, um, we'll also have a product as part of the Registr offering we have, which will be uh, is soon to be um, released in the mid. Um, on the tri-party repo side, um, there are various ways that you can connect uh, into, into systems. So on the bilateral side, um, with regard to instruction and receiving tri-party reports, you could either look at SWIFT if you, you use SWIFT. Um, we have Creation Online, which is our, basically our front-end um, web-based tool. Um, then also looking at OTC, um, there's things like Bloomberg where, again, you agree that on a bilateral basis, it trades via Bloomberg, but Bloomberg will actually send the uh, instruction on your behalf. Um, then finally, for more of a, I suppose, a, an FTP type solution, um, there is 360T. But basically, 360T will um, allow you to instruct and also to, to, to quote for your tri-party uh, trades via their platform. I suppose it's more of a, a, an integrated solution, so to speak, because that means that uh, once you've put your quote out there, you will then uh, get your quotes back from the various banks. And, and with regard to, to MIFID 2, and, and I don't want to go into too much detail, so I think we've, uh, we've agreed we're, we're, we're going to look to avoid that space um, today, but I think from a transparency perspective, it obviously ticks those, those boxes. Um, so hopefully that, that gives you an overview of the sort of technology that, that's available out there. I just want to hand over to Darren Wilson from Pooper. He's going to give you some, uh, some background uh, from his side. Sorry, Darren. Thanks, Steve. Uh, and thanks, Steve, for inviting me, Darren, to present on this webinar. Um, so my name is Darren Wilson. I'm a senior treasury dealer at Pooper. Uh, and I just want to spend a few minutes talking through a couple of slides um, by way of a case study, if you will, uh, having recently launched our, our own uh, repo capabilities uh, using the Tearstream Tri-Party offering. As a brief introduction uh, to, to Booker, um, we have 3.6 billion of uh, financial assets globally, 1.2 billion of us managed in the UK uh, by my team, uh, largely internally. We have significant exposure to the financial sector, as many corporates and insurers out there will have. Uh, in addition to the bank regulation we've discussed, uh, insurers are also required to hold capital against business risks, investment risk under the new Solvency II regime, which went live on the 1st of January. Uh, and so we just have a current initiative to reallocate away from unsecured cash into safer instruments. Uh, and what we're talking about today is, is repo. And I hope to address a couple of key questions so why bother with repo and why the tri-parties? A lot of this will depend on, on your own individual group treasury policies, uh, investment risk appetites, etc. I'll, I'll try and keep it fairly generic um, and also uh, just to highlight some of our, our internal thinking around those points. So, so why repo? Primarily, it's, it's the reduced counterparty risk. This is the lens that's been driving our initiative. Um, it's very important, particularly where risk tolerance is low. And here I'll draw the distinction between different cash buckets I manage in turn. So at a, at a group level, the corporate cash, which is used for general business purposes, uh, for, for repaying external debt, there's very, very low uh, or very limited capacity for risk. Uh, that's why I think this is important. Uh, and additionally, uh, as an insurer with our insurance assets where there is a bit more appetite to take risk and indeed in a return to pay off future liabilities. Um, I don't tend to do that through operational cash and that's where we go play. Most treasurers will identify as security being a primary objective in any investment followed by liquidity and yield. Uh, and if security is your ultimate objective, then Rico makes much more sense than 
unsecured deposits uh, and money market funds which have their, have their own risks. Second lens for, for me was really the, the liquid pools of high quality assets that are available. Initially approaching this from a reverse repo lens whereby Bupo would lend money to its, its banking sector counterparts and receive the collateral. We would then look to use that collateral potentially in the future, uh, as Steve mentioned earlier, either to generate cash should we should get a shortfall, should we need the liquidity, uh, or alternatively to post against collateral, uh, sorry, derivative positions where collateral is required. I also think that on the return point, um, it's comparable to unsecured deposits. Now, they're not like for like. Um, this, it depends on how the repo is structured and what collateral you're willing to receive. Uh, you know, clearly, if, if you're defining your collateral bucket as only gilt, um, it's going to have a different consequence than if you're willing to accept equity. So I think, in, especially in our ultra-low yield environment that we have at the time being, there's very little between the instruments. But for me, it just makes much more sense to have collateral than to not. I've also included a point here on unsecured deposits now being more risky, question mark. And I think there's a few things here. The banking sector reform that's going on is in terms of making banks safer, there's bigger capital buffers to absorb losses, which is certainly a good thing for anyone investing in those counterparties. But equally, the, the discussion that's been happening on the bail-in rules, um, now we have agreement from the European Parliament and Council, uh, what would happen in a Cypriot-type bail-in scenario means depositors could get caught up in, in that bailing, uh, meaning taking haircuts, um, akin to you know, bondholders. And whilst the, the likelihood is fairly unlikely, it's now a possibility. Um, so depositors need to be aware that they carry that risk. Finally, the final point potentially increases the size of the investment universe. Lots of corporate treasurers out there will look to use their relationship banks to provide the ancillary business and reduce their own funding costs. I could quite easily find their credit lines filling up quickly. This may be a way to look at increasing the level of counterparty limit you have with those banks, but on a secure basis, so the level of risk that you're running is actually lower. Equally, it may be that relationship banks who receive a number of downgrades in the previous year, and, and there's a few for us which fall into that bracket. Uh, it's a way of being able to continue doing business um, with something that may fall out, uh, an institution may fall outside of the treasury policy. Um, again, having the additional security, not just taking the credit ratings in isolation. And the final point, it may open up the universe to additional counterparties. Uh, you're not only looking now at, at the initial risk of a bank default, you then have the collateral behind it. So your group treasury policy stipulates single A type credit is your universe, maybe it opens the discussion of our triple D credit but security. So why tri party repo? The big enabler for us was getting around GR GMRAs. Uh, they use a whole uh, whole universe of counterparties for the group's financial assets. Um, the thought of trying to enter into bilateral agreements with 20, 30 different counterparties just consume too much resource. Um, either internally, if you have the legal resource available to negotiate the documentation, if not, it's the expense of getting that done externally. And so that the, the CLC, as Steve mentioned before, the umbrella documentation is a real key enabler. Um, terms are, are specified, everyone signs up to the same terms, makes it very easy to trade with a whole pool of counterparties on the same basis. Another reason why tripartite is very important for us was the collateral management. Uh, that's an operational burden outside the normal scope of business for most treasurers. Uh, Clearstream taking that away from us enables an asset class to be available without that burden. We opted to go down the route of using Creation Online, which is Clearstream's front end portal. Um, I find it very simple to use. There are the mechanisms of, of execution, as you mentioned again earlier, on, for example, through 360T. And using a familiar treasury system may help get internal stakeholder buy-in, uh, you know, without having to think about uh, implementing new systems or uh, IT risks around that. Um, but we prefer to use the creation online and, uh, and just receive the cluster reporting that way. It's very effective for us. Okay, happy to take any, any questions uh, at the end or as they come through.
Right. Uh, we have had some uh, interesting line of questions. Uh, uh, one of them is the amount of burden that falls back on the Treasury of uh, using these. Um, and a question which has come up is there an accounting difficulty of accounting for repo transactions? Darren. Yeah, not an accounting expert, but the accounting is still relatively straightforward. Um, I try and think of it as you know, you're accounting for a, a money market deposit in some respects. Um, you may need to disclose the collateral that you've been pledged in your financial statements, uh, but there's no burdens in accounting. Right, and you mentioned there the various reasons for using repos, Darren. Um, yield is uh, nowadays a secondary issue to security, but do you get any pickup in yield on using repos? Potentially. It depends on the counterpart you're using uh, and also the, the collateral that you require. If you were to use a very well rated bank, you may well question why bother entering into the additional security in the first place. If you're using a very well rated bank and you're having guilt or treasuries, in your collateral basket, you're not going to get much of it. It's probably going to be punitive in that sense, a low, lower risk. If you look at issuers with lower credit ratings and you could open up that basket of collateral to corporate bonds or equities, then you see a premium over what you may see. On your yeah, that's, that's quite an interesting point, actually, because we tend to find that there are some of our clients within corporate clients within tripartite repo that purely saying, well, we're investing our, uh, looking for pick-up and yield. So, so at the end of the day, they're saying that we're investing with the banks already to deposit them on an unsecured basis and getting x rate. Um, we know that we can place the same collateral or the same cash with the same bank against lower rated, lower quality collateral, probably, you know, probably, probably very poor quality, but get a better return. And, and, and this is probably more in line with euro deposits rather than sterling or dollar or anything. It, it, you know, it's purely that fact that it, it's where repo is, is, is where, where the, the banks are looking for some of that, to fund some of that poor quality collateral, get that off the balance sheet, to pull in to actually pay up for, for that type of that type of cash. Uh, and another question that came in there, um, which is really in the administration, uh, that I think possibly we've answered in the presentations, but the choice of the collateral bucket is very much yours to make at the beginning, Darren. So Absolutely. You, you don't have to accept a complex set of buckets to keep track of. If you want gilts, you just say gilts, and that's all you get. But then you can set multiple buckets. Um, you, know, you probably want to err on the side of caution when first entering a particular asset class, and maybe you look you know, for gilts or other European sovereigns which you're comfortable with. But that can be defined up front, and you can have multiple buckets as well. And just as an aside, uh, the accounting question which came in, I do recollect when SFTR was first uh, put out, there was a concern it had to be very detailed uh, reporting um, of uh, the assets held in the national markets, uh, which I believe has gone away. But of course, we're not accountants, and you should discuss this with your accountants. But accounting for repos has not come up as an issue in any of the sessions we've done. Um, um, just on the side of that as well, we, we actually um, issued a, uh, a report or a study done by PwC around the accounting for repo. So, um, you know, if any of your your listeners would, would like to see a copy of that, we'd be more than happy to. Thank you. Uh, Darren mentioned uh, bail-in risk on deposits. Uh, and Nick, would you like to make a comment on how the, uh, the bail-in rules would apply? Yes. So, as Darren said, it's it creates a theoretical risk of, of failure. <clears throat> I think if you look at the detail of how it's structured and how it's implemented in the UK through the Bank of England PRA, the risk of bailing on unsecured corporate deposits is very remote. <clears throat> so what BRRD basically says is banks have to hold sufficient equity and near equity in order to survive any crisis, and that crisis as defined, the worst case crisis defined by the Bank of England in the case of UK banks. Uh, additionally, you have to hold capital so that you can open for business the following day. So this is where you get <coughs> the incorrected tier one numbers for UK banks in the sort of 12 to 14 percent range, and then total loss absorbing capital in the kind of um, low to mid 20 percent range. Under the, the implementation of BRRD, UK banks going forward will be structured with holding companies and then operating companies below that. 
<clears throat> all of resolution and any potential bail-in is meant to occur up at the whole co level, not impacting the opco. So banks will be taking um, corporate and, and taking deposits generally from their customers at the opco, the operating company level. And the, one of the key purposes of BRRD is that banks can be resolved or recovered without impacting day-to-day -day operations. So it would, would occur at the whole co level. So yes, BRRD does kind of raise bail-in as a potential risk. Um, theoretically, it's always been a risk out there. If, if, if a bank goes under, potentially depositors are at risk. What BRRD does, plus the other BAR3 requirements, is it's significantly increased bank capital and structurally made it uh, actually a more remote possibility. Okay, um, getting back to more uh, nuts and bolts, one uh, question that was coming here is, what is the minimum investment and the time scale of investments that justify really setting up a re monetary value that you've got to have to, to get out there? I mean, that, that could be, from a clear stream technical perspective, you know, we don't set any minimum values from a, a repo deposit, but I think you probably need to speak to your banking counterparts with regard to what they'd be happy to accept volume-wise. So um, I think a lot of that would depend on the term of the trade and potentially the catch as well. I don't know what the yeah, views I mean, are. I, our view would be, of course, if, if, if a client wants to do a repo, we will do a repo of any size that, that suits the client. Um, you know, given though, even through dry party, you know, there is an element to set up costs. You, it, it's not worth doing if you're going to do the occasional five or ten million pound repo. If, if you have more substantial balances and you're looking to do it on a regular basis, yes, it makes much more sense. Right, uh, and if we just look at the overall position, because one of the questions that was coming and said, well, why, why would you do this through a repo mechanism? Why not just go and buy securities? Um, clearly, uh, one of the advantages you get the repo is that you you have your maturity price agreed at inception, so you know exactly what you're getting back, so you have the liquidity risk of the instrument invested in. But there could be the case even with a repo where you've over-invested get yourself out of the repo, you need to get the funds back. What would be the process in repo world that you would use to do that? Is it a reverse reverse repo or is it uh Well, there, there, are, okay. yeah, you, you, there are a number of options that would be available to you. Now, number one would be if, if you need to get your cash back at any point, then uh, you, know, you probably have that discussion with your counterparty. Say that you know you, you look to, to potentially break the trade and, and change the terms. That may mean that there may be some um, discussions around the the repo rate, for example, or, or what you've currently been charged. Um, the other option, of course, is potentially you could then reuse the collateral with either the same counterparty or even with another counterparty within the sort of tri-party world to actually get your cash back for the the duration of of when you actually require the cash, for example, until another trade uh, comes off or closes. So you've say so you've got the opportunity to talk to your counterparty with regards to the trade you currently have on with them, or you could actually reuse that collateral to get cash back. So you could then be a cash taker yourself. Yeah, we would most normally do it with a card through, through reversing the, the trade, putting on another trade to reverse it. Right. Um, and uh, got a few minutes to go, but uh, one question is coming is a clear one about how is yield determined? Um, I, I, I believe the answer is as simple as we're looking at the deposit yield curve to price these off. Is there anything more sophisticated going on on that, or is it? Uh, as Steve has alluded to what is the what are the baskets of assets that you're willing to take? Um, is there any simplistic way of determining this? I mean, the, the, the real driver is, is demand supply. Um, so, so yes, you'd, you'd reference LIBOR and, and deposit curves, but you know, banks and other counterparties, it's a different <coughs> part of the balance sheet and it's priced differently. And it, the, the key driver is demand supply. Um, what 
corporates typically are enjoying is being the other side of large funds, pension funds, for example, that are lending their securities out in order to gear up their portfolios and enhance portfolio return. So the demand supply and balance tends to be in favor of those placing cash into the system and, and taking that collateral, which is particularly in the short term why quite often the prices are quite attractive. And uh, without wishing at all to annoy Nick as our, our banker here, uh, uh, possibly Steve, you're the best to uh, answer this. Is there potential for genuine disintermediation? Is that a repo directly corporate pension fund or corporate insurance fund that can be explored? Um, I, I suppose that's something that, that could come into place. It's not something that the clinician advocating. But with regard to the number of clients we have within our tri-party system, we have over 500 that have a sort of central banks, commercial banks, broker dealers, corporate insurance companies. So with regard to, to if they're all signed up to do tri-party, then they wanted to then do that tri-party transaction with other members within the community. Then. Just add to that, so the, I suppose the additional dimension is uh, it may be more complicated for peer-to-peer -peer type lending to do, um, do credit analysis for corporate treasuries. Uh, I guess you could say comfort in the fact that any lending would be secured, but so you wanted to conduct an analysis may not be as clear, for example, when looking at PRA registered you know, opcos within the banking sector compared to a, a pension fund you may be familiar with or a corporate that, that name isn't known. Okay, and on costs overall, uh, the particular question has been phrased in terms of setup costs, but I think there's really two types of costs here. There's setup costs and there's the settlement costs as you go through. Yeah. Um, settlement costs, as my understanding, are, are usually borne uh, by, uh, by the borrower yeah. of the money in this case and not by the investor, so they're built into the yield. But on setup costs, uh, Darren, is there any quantifying sort of per counterparty costs in your mind, uh, trying to get a feel for the scale that uh, yeah. you know, I've got to go through. I probably couldn't give you a basis point for a counterparty answer. Uh, for us, there was very minimal cost because the CLC documentation enabled us to handle it internally without going out to uh, legal counsel for multiple, multiple counterparties. So I think the actual fees we incurred were in the really a few thousand pounds in terms of documentation review. Um, other than that, that hasn't been any so you're quite right with regard to the it, it, within tripartite. It's always the collateral giver or the cash taker that the agency. And I'd say from the cost from, from Darren's side, it's probably their own time. But with regard to, to trying to walk them through that, you know, we try to hold their hand as much as possible. And clearly, this depends on the uh, the organisation. Uh, in-house lawyers and expert treasury staff, and clearly, if you're in smaller organisations, <coughs> it may have a resource issue. Um, we're getting uh, close to the end there. Uh, we have answered uh, all the questions which have come in. Uh, I think it's time to start wrapping up. Uh, first, to thank Steve, Nick, and Darren, Dean Stream, Lloyd, and Boover. Um, we'd like to thank you all who joined today's session. Uh, if there are any more questions which uh, come in, uh, we will pass those over to the uh, three presenters to answer. As I mentioned at the start, we'll be putting up a recording of this webinar on the ACT website along with the presentation in two days' time. And all of those who have uh, attended the course, uh, you'll be getting a link to get you to that. Now, looking forward to the rest of the year. Uh, we have our next webinar coming up on the 23rd of March. That will be on corporate liquidity uh, and managing the critical change, uh, challenges facing treasuries in 2016. We have our Europe conference on the 9th of March. We have the ACT Middle East dinner on the 11th of May in Dubai. Uh, and the main conference takes place on the 18th and 20th of May in Liverpool. Uh, and a reminder there, a bit more longer term thinking, our ACT annual dinner on the 9th of November. Now, thank you for listening. And if you can spare a moment to write feedback on the webinar, we will be very grateful. Just select the feedback widget in red on the bottom bar. The facilitators 
please remain open for a short time after the webinar ends. So from all of us here, thank you and goodbye.